What am I? What are we anyways? What am I? What are we anyways? Spoken language as inner speech, extended and embodied. A reminder, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. We are magic to our minds. Meaning is the technology of thinking. Thinking is the brain word processing. Inner speech is so well developed by the time a more complete consciousness, relative self-awareness, makes its appearance in the individual that we are almost completely unaware of words and sentences going through our minds or how those words and sentences got there into our minds. And we, perforce, believe in what we think or say more or less explicitly. Just as we somewhat naively assume the physical world and all its glory, in spite of what science shows us in myriad ways, we assume the knowledge and the truth of the word world. Analogously, this is all also true for Homo as a cultural species. By the time culture and community had developed complexly, and words, meanings, language had infected the minds of almost all of humanity, philosophers and scientists and religionists already assumed the truth of speaking and the obvious veracity of words applied to the world they saw outside their skulls. <clears throat> there was a time when proto-homo sapiens was speechless. This is a simple affirmation, but it's hard for us moderns to imagine, and more than obviously true in almost all the imaginings we have around early humans. Scientist types look for a big jump in brain size or brain differentiation as the reason that language develops. They don't see or believe that culture needed to be developed and industrialized in a certain manner first. That culture is a determining environment, a deeply patterning environment. Inner speech needs to generalize first, then the clown, then the clan must be stable enough to allow the externalization of the new automaton. Then the baby humans must be presented with inner outer speech continually at the earliest stage of neural plasticity. And this peculiar group of proto-humans must also have the potentialities of verbal articulation that many surrounding groups don't possess. Imagine, if you will, early humanity. At an early stage, there is still little spoken language. Some concepts are slowly getting differentiated in individual minds. Complex environments are forcing it. We might compare this to the complex social material networks of modern, free-ranging chimpanzees or gorillas, but with a slightly different brain, of course. At this stage, there is plenty of culture, all the complex kinds of culture that simians live, but it's not yet an advanced word culture at all. 
an individual in a certain context articulates a few words. A companion is complexly enough evolved to grog what was said, to match a sound word consistently with an object or situation. An aside, when we've tried to teach chimpanzees to speak, no matter how hard we tried, we've never gotten past this stage. Words don't attach to categories. The words can be re-articulated or re-signed a million times in a million ways in the animal's environment, but the animals don't can't do the simple thing a nine to 15 month old can do so effortlessly and unconsciously. See the connection between the sound and the meaning. Mimic it, repeat it, tell others about it. The, the thought or category or image concept in the first person's mind appears in the second person's mind and maybe in a few of the neighbor's minds likewise, the kibitzers. Complex sound waves can become the embodiment, the analog spreader extender of the words in the individual's head, in his or her mind. The word itself, the Lego together waveform, is a type of embodiment and extended into the community analog of a complex brain experience. The brain must have learned to hold an object or pattern, object permanency. Now a sound pattern repeats itself enough to stick with the analog of the object, the meaning of the object, the concatenated hierarchy that forms the, in the first individual's noggin. <coughs> And slowly, more words accumulate, and the group's grogging becomes quicker, more accurate. Concepts at a primitive level become shareable. What's in her mind can be in our minds. We can parallel process it and maybe improve it. When I hear what she said in my mind, Another thought, I hear that in my mind, or when I say it aloud, may relate to what she said, or even add something important to what she grogged or understood. When she squawks, gazelle, my mind attaches near lake, and I sputter that, and we go investigate. Words increase in number and differentiate. And words put together in the right way, the complex of meanings being represented by the phonological patterning anyways, catch what's happening and encapsulate, recapitulate symbolically relationships. The shared word the articulated word is now out there to the neighbors. It allows them to process what was articulated. First, to map the sentence into their own minds, then to extract the meaning of the mapping for themselves, as if they themselves had uttered the sentence, as if they themselves had had that thought. We take this for granted, but it's interesting to imagine that mankind may have had to develop this skill, learn slowly over centuries or even millennia that spoken words could be used for more than signaling. Maybe it was analogous to humans eventually learning to read. 
we read eventually like we breathe, unconsciously performing the myriad of automatisms without seeing, feeling, attending to any of the subskills. But a child has to be forced to perform many unnatural behaviors to learn to read fluently. People of long ago may have had to pay attention to each stiff and stodgy word at a time until the flywheel of competent inner outer speech gained enough inertia to spin on its own. Now the neighbors can repeat what the first person said and a genius among them may have quite a new idea that's tagged onto the first one. This is analogous to what I call parallel processing with the written word. We'll see this in the next chapter. Now many brains can parallel process, rearticulate, and even reformat what the one individual or the group has differentiated or spoken about. And just like much later, groups can work on frozen articulations, written speech, written descriptions and propositions in radical new ways and with much amplified competences. Now, small and large groups are able to perfect articulated articulated and extended inner speech, the spoken word, in radically more effective ways. Thus is culture first created. Thus is the individual mind expanded and made visible to others. And thus is thought transmuted transmitted and transmuted, somewhat freed from the individual human matrix, some chap's noggin, and made available to the environment. And many automatons can now be applied to the utterances from uniquely elaborated word processors, individuals. <clears throat> We have very fuzzy notions of what language really is, in my opinion, and even fuzzier ideas about my, how it might have developed. And typically, we project back modern assumptions and presumptions about the people who were alive many millennia ago, wanting to see them as just about more or less just like us. We're maybe talking about a hundred or uh, 10,000 or 20,000 years of embedded and extended inner speech of the modern description, or even quite a bit less. Conditions to reach critical mass and really begin the word mind's modern development may have happened only quite recently just like the invention of writing, and more pointedly, the universal dissemination of reading material and the reading automaton and universal availability of written, the written word is only actually centuries old. Remember, 20,000 years ago, the whole world's population of humans may have been a few million. A few million souls spread ever so sparsely over the globe. Prey to disease, dying on average about 30 years of age. Tragically, but mundanely, 20% of children dying in or soon after childbirth. For most of history, much hungrier generally, than modern humans, subject to disease and accidents and infections, and even predation by other predators. Certainly predation by other human predators. 
the nuclear chain reaction of modern speech may have been near impossible under these conditions. With very sparse populations, with radically different and difficult child rearing practices, and in particular, without intensely patterned practicing of all the complex automatisms of speech, the populations of the world may have used sound much more as signaling than as the type of speech we imagine when we think of modern communication. It may not have been that useful at our first go at it in its first iteration. Last chapter, I typified the environment of a modern family engaging the toddler. Let's repeat it to distinguish and contrast such behavior from archaic patterns. Talked to just about constantly by family and friends, and eventually by preschool teachers, teachers, talking to itself just about constantly, learning and loving story after story, conversation after conversation, words being given and generated and absorbed continually, attaching together dynamically and hierarchically according to levels of abstraction that are embedded deeper and deeper into the child's language self. What might be called archaic cultures, pre-verbal nuclear chain reaction clan groupings, may have had no sense of how or why language would even be effective. There were as yet no writings, no books. One clan's language might be almost completely unintelligible to most other clans. And there as yet were no knowledges, organized clan generated sciences or wisdoms that passed along gave power to the individuals or clans who possessed such words. And without the incredibly directed and perseverative focus of clan members, mommy, daddy, family, on constant repetition and competent acquisition of cultural knowledge and knowledges, clan transmitted canons of procedural and verbal truths that radically changed survival possibilities for the individual and the clan itself. Children may not have developed verbal competence of the modern variety. Words wouldn't have appeared in their heads like they do our children. And certainly the noosphere, Teilhard de Chardin's term for the total cultural environmental or environment of words, ideas, machinery, or what I call the wordified modern environment, wouldn't have molded men's minds in the myriad upon myriad ways the modern world molds the modern psyche. If the environment and the brain co-create each other, the signal, the world, differentiates brain tissue while the brain tissue conforms itself to the signal more and more effectively. Archaic humankind may have had a completely different brain from the modern word encrusted brain. <coughs> Children learn concepts slowly for a while, not only because their brains are myelinating and wiring themselves, which does take a few years, but also because ideas differentiate themselves and are by their nature nested. Complexly constructed meaning is nested in and within 
complexly constructed meaning. This is a powerful idea. Complexly constructed meaning is nested in and within complexly constructed meaning. The nesting takes time and a great deal of step-by-step -step constructing. It's like organic chemistry. Complex mo molecules are built from and by and of complex molecules. All the core metaphors of biology must be acquired before expert biologists can possibly comprehend biology. Early humans had no mental matrix to introject knowledges into. There was a time when complexly constructed meaning didn't yet exist, hadn't been created yet. All the knowledges we take for granted were only potential. Gerald Edelman shows how metaphor of necessity, when not yet differentiated by more and more complex language, has a wide range but little precision. This is more than obvious in children's language development. I imagine early human language started rather narrowly, concretely, and instrumentally, but very, very wide in range and very imprecisely. And I imagine that the kinds of repetitions that sculpt and channel brain paths, especially the implantation of complex abstractions, would not appear reliably in human repertoires for quite a while. Very low populations. Wandering of the nomads being more than a little distracting. No schools, no accumulated treasure troves of knowledge and praxis. Low general competences due to many factors. Very few words for the average citizen. And if the community doesn't see or feel the payoff of constant language use, it won't put in the hours to foment the automatisms. The engine of our societies is driven by the fuel of common success and power gained for the group and for the individual. Another part of it may also be that until the throat, vocal cords, tongue, and lips become coherently functional, the words cannot become group extended. We forget how extraordinarily precisely metered articulation is. If the cro couldn't mouth words, it may be that the words wouldn't, couldn't proliferate. And equally important, until the complex of multimodal integration of the necessary associative motor CNS modules, which arrive, arise via perseverative patenting at peak readiness intervals, until these modules arose, speech could have been limited and scarcely effective. As much about instrumental signaling as about what we consider communication, like among apes today. We can presume that primates, because of massi massively developed cerebral associative tissue, compared to your basic mammal, develop the ability to consistently recognize repeating patterns of complex visual patterning. 
the great apes, chimps, bonobos, and other simians seem readily to differentiate and recognize objects, other creatures, friends, and foes in their environments. And the same animals, especially in complex wild environments, perform very complex behaviors and evince great nonverbal intelligences. Same for the small scattered tribes of wandering humanoids. Then something develops itself. Inner speech, the autonomous, autonomously generated, heard in the head, word fragment sentence, transmutes into outer speech. Outer speech becomes an evolving, embodied and extended, outside the body form of thought. It starts to work, to be effective, to pay off. Inner speech begins somewhat haphazardly at this time. Multimodal connectednesses are what the brain does well. Clan-generated word token connectednesses generalize, but it does take a while. The child's thought becomes extended into the community, into the culture, and embodied in transmissible clan-enabled sound tokens. The words become dense enough, have long enough half-lives, become stable enough, so that in an environment of invisible meanings begin to extend into the local ecospheres in new ways. The group remembers, remembers things over time. Stories become effective automatons for modulating behavior. A few stories start to outlive their creators. Knowledges start to outlive the individual. A few thoughts, a question. What is thinking? By examining how children accumulate words, we see that the clan, culture, already possesses very, very complicated processes that it must inculcate or introject into young, wordless humans. And at some somewhat variable age or stage, the child starts to speak. The words the culture holds become operable in the child. The culture's words start to speak themselves in the child. And the process becomes more and more complex. It's not so much that humans make culture, but that culture makes humans. We think the stories of science, religion, philosophy, and literature as if they are describing something objective, something beside the stories themselves, something out there. But children need to be given stories. The clan needed to learn to make up its stories. The out there itself has to be created. Stories are series of words that manifest invisible meaning structures, extend the meaning structures into the environment. These two also have to be implanted. Stories are a series of words that manifest invisible meaning structures that most literally are the world out there. Astronomical stories create the far-flung universe. Geographical stories manufacture the world around us. Linked conceptual fragments, Lego together, 
mostly abstract structures that we come to believe in. Our culture implants its predominant stories in a thousand powerful ways. Descriptions of quarks, atoms, and molecules. Descriptions of the origin of the universe, secular or religious. Descriptions of humanity and its activities, past or present, future, rights, wrongs, good or bad, stories. In previous epochs, prior to the last 200 years, almost all story posited, omniscient, and omnipotent universal humanoid intelligences, gods or God, acting much like human subjects or devotees and having all kinds of adventures. I hear or study knowledges, clan imprimatured canons of facts and relevant automatisms, and the descriptions appear in me, appear to me, articulate themselves in my mind serially as inner speech. And we've all heard and studied the same knowledges. So the same descriptions appear in our minds. We believe the main objective knowledges altogether. When I think about Florida, a long or short series of pictures and remembrances and related facts appear in a linear series of thoughts. When I think of the Andromeda galaxy, a long or short series of semi-remembered images and facts appear in my mind as a linear series of thoughts. When I describe my day for my wife, I articulate, project my inner speech via outer speech, a linear series of sentences that seem to relate to the domain of lived life. When I read a novel or a physics textbook, linear series of sentences seem to create experiences that relate to what the author wants me to know. Linear series of sentences. That is what the mind does. And that is what science does. And that is what the world is composed of. And that is what I am composed of too until the brain ceases being able to compose. A quick summary. Our children's brains are patterned by language, a very intricate web of interrelated, concatenated words and culture-mediated correspondences function corresponding to things, existence, actions, and descriptors, as well as many kinds of purely language-related data structures mediated by speech. But Jackendorf has shown that what we can be aware of, what we can be conscious of, is not meaning, not the web of correspondences themselves, but what he calls phonology, words in our heads, words in our heads. Words get into our heads via culture, mommy, daddy's utter utterances, are structured and put into motion by culture and are what culture does in the world. But we don't and cannot access the meaning behind the words. We experience meaning as we hear words in our heads 
all the jointings of the world and verbal tokenings happen unconsciously in the brain and function autonomously outside consciousness. Analogously, each concept contains many other concepts in itself, potentially and multimodally. Words are complexly concatenated and hierarchalized, oral mediated, clan generated patterns relating to complexly concatenated and hierarchalized patterns of perception and proprioception. Each other concept, even vaguely related to dog, D-O-G, including smells, visual differentiation, sounds, etc., is liable to be called up as part of the gestalt relationship during thought or while talking or describing. The brain is a genius of concatenations at many levels. The brain is ever priming itself with potentially related perceptually token gestalts. Words are continually being thrown up unconsciously. That is, this is evidenced by priming studies of many varieties for consideration and use if found aptly congruent. The invisible data structure, the invisible concatenations of the words themselves constrict which words fit together. The invisible data structures, concatenations of related tokens for dog are analogous to nodes of related and potentially relatable related congruences of many and multimodal varieties. And the invisible data structures of meaning and standard use are what makes sense of the world for the clan. That's complicated, but it may be true. I remind you that language is learned, accreted, step by step by hearing via the oral system. Outer speech, words and phrases articulated consistently by people and mapped to consistently paired objects and experiencings. Outer speech is the sole medium for acquiring clan sanctioned words, inner speech, for the first seven years. What this means is that the oft repeated vocalizations of others become reliably attached to accreting concepts and select percepts and every kind of experience and in turn become heard in my head and they words and they words in turn become perceptual discriminations in themselves this will be elaborated in detail as we go ahead i repeat myself because this is a most startling and difficult to grog formulation we inhabit the word world so seamlessly that we cannot experience the processes of words themselves. We live in meanings that are used and usable, but non-conscious, non-retrievable in themselves. We don't and cannot access the meaning behind the words. We hear them in our heads. Hearing your words in my head 
means that my unconscious brain processes what has been in your head. Then I hear what I speak back to you, which shows how I have processed, how my brain has processed, what you transmitted to me. Massively concatenated words and their inextricably bound relationships and their near instantaneous retrieval process, 20, 30 millisecond atoms of correspondence chunked automatically. All this happened. Any word can trigger thousands of correspondences, other words, phrases, primordially attached to the trigger word. And these words, these correspondences appear in my mind, one after the other, not according to will, but according to the unconscious rules of thought interjected into the child's mind via culture. Inner speech becomes outer speech. This is a deep process, is it not?